I want to take this first session this morning to continue on further dealing with the searching the hearts and then my goal is to move on in our second session and to talk about uh, the mind of the spirit and move on into the issue of the will of God and um, again this is a, a critical passage if you can rack your brains in regards to what this content is dealing with we've dealt with that already that the spirit is continuing to help us here uh, by way of this information and he is going to help our infirmities those infirmities specifically are described for us in the rest of verse 26 for we know not what the pray, what we should pray for as we ought there's some things that we ought to know that we don't know and the spirit is going to help us essentially get that knowledge and the way in which he gets that knowledge again the one who's educating us is essentially the father he's going to use utilize the spirit of adoption that he is and um, he's going to come along and provide the spirit that knowledge that we ought to know and there's an intercession therefore that goes on on our behalf by the spirit to get us that knowledge we talked about the issue of with groanings which cannot be uttered there in verse 26 the restrictive exclusive nature of the knowledge uh, specifically to us we looked at all those pronouns in these verses that describe uh, that and we, we compared it to first Corinthians chapter 2 and saw that uh, that knowledge and that information is revealed to us those that are spiritual those that are in Christ and those that want to come to learn it uh, it's not for the unbeliever it's not for the natural man it's for the spiritual man and his intercession therefore takes place in such a way uh, consistent with that and then we began to move on to verse 27 um, and in verse 27 it almost kind of jumps it jumps from this issue of not knowing what we ought to know the spirit makes intercession for us to the father here in verse 27 searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit and you have a general statement um, being being given here in verse 27 and he that's the father that's God that searcheth the hearts he searches all hearts he searches the hearts of unbelievers and believers it's a something that he does um, also in connection with uh, his judgment that's one of the things that's going to be manifest the secrets of the hearts and the thoughts of the heart uh, is going to be made manifest and uh, they'll be judged uh, for those things not only the things that come outward but the things that come outward and the actions and the the things that come out of the mouth uh, all that takes place because of what's going on in the inward man and um, therefore God searches the hearts of the unbeliever as well as for the believer and what <clears throat> I wanted you to see in connection with Paul kind of jumping to that is that when the Spirit makes intercession for us to gain the knowledge that we ought to know that's supposed to go somewhere and that's what the Father is looking for it's supposed to go on go in our hearts uh, that's consistent with the spiritual things in the New Testament uh, that the Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit that He is, is going to write some things in our heart. And what He's going to write is the knowledge that we ought to know, specifically to us in this dispensation of God's grace. Uh, to Israel, He's going to write the things that they need to know in regards to their program. He's going to write that on their hearts. And so you have a mystery program of the New Testament. Um, and that's what that's what being described in connection here with Romans chapter 8 and further on as we get into 9 chapters 9 10 and 11 you have the spiritual things in the New Testament and God's gonna take that provision and provide the the content of the mystery and the mystery purpose and all those kind of things and be able to fulfill that aspect of his will in connection with the New Testament the New Testament provides God to do what he wants to do with Israel and it provides God also the ability to do with what he wants to do with us which was hid in time past since the since the beginning of the world um, but he searches the hearts and he's looking for something he does that and we're going to talk a little bit more about that we're going to talk about the heart and how crucial it is in regards to our walk um, not only that God searches the hearts but how he does that and how we are to participate in that and the responsibility we have uh, with that but also that he's looking for something because the Spirit made intercession for us and he got that knowledge from the Father when the Father searches the hearts he's looking for he knows the mind of the Spirit 
uh, it's, 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 kind of a, it's, it's kind of a duh statement um, that the Spirit makes intercession for us. So here's the interaction between the Father and the Spirit. That, that knowledge that comes from the Father, that's given to the Spirit, that by way he teaches us, is the mind of the Spirit that's supposed to be in our hearts. So that when the Father then goes and searches the heart, searches our heart, he knows what's the mind of the Spirit because the intercession has already taken place. And you, you look at that and you kind of say, well, that's, yeah, that's the way it should be. If, if the Spirit made intercession for us, he got what we need, and now he gives it to us, and the Father comes along, he's going to be able to identify, because the intercession takes place, what the mind of the Spirit is. And you ask, well, why, why, why do you need all that? Why do we need, why do we need to know all that? Well, we need to know all that because, one, we need to know that the Father is searching our hearts and that he's looking for something. And he's looking for exact, he's, what he's looking for and what he knows is exactly what took place in regards to the intercession. And therefore, all the more, the exclusive nature of the knowledge that we ought to know is found right here. It's found in God's word. We don't have to go outside of it. We just go right here. And um, not only that, but what we have, therefore, right here is exactly what the Father gave, as it were, to the Spirit. The very knowledge that we ought to know. It's tailor-made for us. And uh, that's a wonderful thing to know. And that gives us an assurance, and it gives us a confidence that all that we need to know, we're going to get is if we just follow the words on the page and continue to learn them and live by them. And so we kind of we dealt with just the general framework of the verse. And then we began to look at some passages in connection with God searching the heart. We looked at 1 Chronicles, I believe it is, 1 Chronicles 28, verse 9. We looked at some passages in the Psalms. What I want to do as we go forward is I want to look at some things in connection with what Paul says um, regarding the heart. And then I want to move to... Uh, kind of back to the Old Testament scriptures and talk a little bit more about the heart and its capacity and its functionality. Uh, we're not going to learn everything because uh, it's just a huge issue uh, to, to learn about. Um, but I want you to get the gist that our hearts are crucial. It's one of those things, the heart. Uh, the mind is a, is a little bit easier to kind of understand, but we have to understand the mind and the heart are connected issues. He talks about the thoughts and intents of the heart. The heart thinks. The heart minds. Uh, we don't think of it that way. We usually think about our physical anatomy. Here you have the mind or the brain, as it were, and the heart here. But when you talk about the composition of our inward man, that which we cannot see, the, our spirit, when you talk about the different components uh, that comprise our spirit. You have a mind and a heart, and those things are linked together. Those things are connected to where you can have statements in the scriptures that simply just talk about the mind, just talk about the heart, just talk about the thoughts, talk about affections, but then you'll have passages that lump them together, the thoughts of the heart, the imaginations of the heart, and the heart uh, it can produce and birth those things. And so we're going to take a look at some of those things, but what I want you to most of all understand is one, the heart has a crucial role to play in our walk. And not only that, but it had a crucial role to play when we first believed the gospel. And it's one of those things that we're not necessarily consciously aware of, but that we need to become aware of, is our heart and what's there and what's in there and take stock of our heart and be in tune, therefore, with our own heart in light of his heart. Um, one of the most famous passages or famous expressions or um, quotes, if you want to call it that, in all the scriptures is in regards to David. David was a man after God's own heart. That means his heart was in tune with God's heart. And he went after. David was a man after God's own heart. And that took some heart examination. And you see this with 
Some of the most, the, uh, most primary places you see the heart being talked about is in Psalms, the Proverbs. You, t you see it being talked about in connection with uh, the Lord's earthly ministry as well as what, what Paul teaches. And so again, we're going to take a look at some of those things. And so again, I just want to uh, begin to look at these things. I want to first go back. I want to go back to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. <clears throat> In fact, let's go back a little bit further. Get Romans 6 and also get Romans chapter 1. We we'll see the combination of the imaginations and the heart here in Romans chapter 1 when we first began the book. As Paul talks about man in time past and how they knew God and then they became vain in their imaginations. He talks about how that's all worthy of God's wrath. We'll pick it up here in verse 20. He says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. What's interesting there, he already describes, it's almost as their imaginations that are vain, that comprises the foolish heart, but their foolish heart was then darkened. There's a, a step process, a step-by-step -step process to the devolution of man and the inward part of man. Um, not only is it dead by nature, but also it can evolve in its ungodliness. It can evolve in its darkness. Uh, and there's uh, depths of depravity, as it were, and that's what Paul is beginning to describe. We also have the expression, um, you can turn there if you like, you can leave Romans chapter 1, but in Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, before the flood, we saw that expression there in verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Just think about those words. Think about what he says there. That every imagination of the thoughts, the plurality of thoughts, of thoughts, not just a thought, but thoughts. That's what goes on in our minds on a day-by-day -day basis. Whether you're a believer or unbeliever, thoughts take place. And he describes their imagination. In fact, he says every imagination, every thought that they had. And notice, he says these Proceed from the thoughts, proceed from the thoughts of, their possessions of his heart. Was only, there's, there's, no, there's no caveat to this. There's no uh, extenuating circumstance besides Noah. But when you look at the whole earth at this time, all these words are descriptive of every thought of every man that proceeds from every heart was only evil, and then you have that temporal relationship word continually. Every day, every minute, every hour, every year, that's what's going on in man. There's no, those words don't let you get around thinking about it but that way. And this came out. The wickedness that manifests itself from this inward action of every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually into verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with what? Violence. Peter calls this time the world of the ungodly. He doesn't just say there were some that were ungodly. He calls it the world of the ungodly. That's where we're headed. 
Um, we don't have news at home. Uh, we don't have we have a TV, but we don't have cable or any of those type of things. It barely goes on. Besides, when they watch Bible stories and those kind of things. But when we we're at my parents. Uh, they have news and those kind of things, and they get the newspaper. We don't get the newspaper. I'm not just a big news guy, and I read some of that newspaper. I just couldn't believe, and I heard some of the news. I just, I was just astounded. I, I, I've, we've separated ourselves from it, and to hear some of the things, I'm, I was just couldn't believe it. There was one story of a someone writing to the newspaper, this gal who, with her philosophy and psychology, deals with problems. And a mom wrote in and said, it was a six-year-old son or something like that, she bought him a video game, and now the son has picked up on this unique language that the video game teaches, some dragon, dragon language. And he goes around now hitting people, and she says, I don't know what to do. And I was just like, one, why did you get the game in the first place? Two, take away the game. Three, discipline that child. And, and you don't know what to do. And that's, a, that's just a minor case. But you get that, and then you start seeing how one guy enters his house with a gun. It was a pastor's house and those kind of things, and pastor decided not to shoot him and all that kind of stuff, but, but his alcohol level, and, and you just see the spectrum from the young age to that age to greater things going on, greater evil going on. I'm just appalled, and I think how critical. It's at times like that where you think about what you know and how thankful you are, and how truly, how much he has sanctified you by his word. And then I start thinking that verse, preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Just preach it, because that's what we need to separate. That's what God's going to utilize to separate ourselves. But we're not the world of the ungodly yet. There's a lot of ungodliness in the world, but it's not like this time was. It will eventually get that way again. But the imagination and the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And that's what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 1. And that continues on even after the flood. Because although Noah is not ascribing to these things, the capacity for this to take place is still in him. And so him and his family, even though they come out of the, the flood and all those kinds, all those things, when they begin to have children, is still in man. And it comes up again. God does some things in connection with the flood to make sure that this time, the world of Nengali doesn't develop as fast as it did. But the violence and all those kind of things, that was a manifestation of what's going on inwardly. And that's what Paul's describing there in Romans chapter 1. Let, let me just give you the, I know I kind of have a couple paths here that we're looking at, but I just want to give you a kind of a spectrum of the heart and its um, capacity and its role and how many times it's mentioned and those kind of things. Let me give you the, the spectrum from that to our high calling in Christ Jesus and the capacity and power of the Word of God. Look at 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Every imagination... The thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. No wonder why, when you start to see that, and that is in man, even after the flood, although the world, that world is going to develop a little bit slowly, it's still going to be, there's going to be that characteristic and feature in the world in which we live. That capacity is in us. But now that we have the Word of God, now that we're in Christ, now that we have the Spirit, and when the Spirit goes and makes intercession before the Father, and there's some things that we ought to know, the, the, the power and the dynamic nature of that knowledge is able to do this. Look at verse 3 of chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 
Where are these strongholds? Verse 5. Casting down what? Imaginations. And, there's that word, every high thing that exalteth itself against the what? Knowledge of God. The things that we ought to know that God gives. The knowledge that proceeds from God. The, the knowledge of God and therefore the knowledge that proceeds from God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <sighs> wow! Man has the capacity to have every one of their thoughts evil continually. And we as believers, not because of ourselves, but because of what we have in Christ, and because of the power of the Word of God. This is, this is all coming out of our passage in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is phenomenal in what it's, what it's teaching us and giving us a glimpse to that Paul later refers to and expounds upon in greater detail. But the issue here is that now that we're in Christ, now that we have the Spirit, and now because the Spirit made intercession for us before the Father, and He's going to teach us the knowledge of God we therefore have the capacity to bring every, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Every single thought. That doesn't mean it doesn't take, we got to bring it into captivity. That doesn't mean it just takes place. We still have those thoughts. We still live in the world that is ungodly and that is easy for those thoughts to, to, to come into our minds and those kind of things. We have to bring it into captivity. You can only bring in something into captivity when you have something stronger, more powerful. And we have the knowledge of God. It's stronger. It's mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have to cast down imaginations. And that's part of the, the searching of the hearts that if we know that God is searching our hearts, we too, therefore, should be concerned about what's in our hearts, what's in our minds, what's in our thoughts. Because if we care, the searching of the hearts only benefits those who really care about God searching their hearts. If you're an unbeliever, you don't care about God, you don't care about Him searching your hearts, you don't care what He finds. A lot of believers don't care that God searches their hearts, nor does it impact them anyway. But if you know that God's searching your hearts and he, that he's wanting to find something, he's looking for something there, that ought to concern you and, and, and put that godly fear that I want there what he wants there. I care about what's going in there because he's looking for something. To the point that when there's something there that's of me, an imagination of me, I'm going to take his knowledge and I'm going to cast that down. I'm going to bring that into captivity. And have my thoughts to the obedience of Christ. And that's something... That when Paul... That's one of the reasons why prayer is so important. Prayer has so many applications and so many reasons for its use. But why Paul's going to say continuing instant in prayer. One of the ways in which you can utilize prayer is when one of those imaginations pops up and you dwell on it and you're going to uh, maybe act on it or before you act on it or any of those kind of things that you bring it into captivity. And prayer is the means by taking the word of God that's in you, bring it to mind, and bring it to captivity, and, and hold in, the, in your heart, on, the, on the, the mantle of your heart, the knowledge of God instead of your own imagination or the thoughts of the world. That's hard sometimes. Especially when you've given yourself to something prior to that. Uh, one of the things, especially since the last election, is, is politics. And people will hold on to their political views and they'll hold it on the mantle of their heart instead of the knowledge of God. That takes place when you study God's word. 
and you have a certain thought and understanding of God's word that maybe you've learned in the past and, and, and you're learning something different or, or something else has come up. I, that, happened, that has happened to me many times where I've read something and I'm like, that's what it's saying, but that's not how I learned it before. And you have a choice. Am I going to stick with what I once learned or are you going to stick with now what, what you come to understand in regards to uh, that, that new understanding of it? And are you going to take captive that or are you going to allow it? And this, this, this takes place in so many different ways. And we'll talk about that more and more as we go on. But two ends of the spectrum. Every imagination and thought of his, his heart was only evil continually. And we can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Because of what we have. It's mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds in our minds. Well, now come back with me to Romans chapter 6. So we have saw that combination of the, the imaginations and the heart in Romans chapter 1 and, and how he described that about a certain, that certain time and time past. We've also seen in previous messages that when Adam sinned and, and the fall took place, they hide themselves and they hear the voice of God and that voice of God, when he's going to come and deal with, with Adam, he poses questions to him. And that's one of the ways in which the searching of the heart, searching can take place. Is by asking questions. And it's no coincidence that in chapter 8, as we get down to verse 31, we're going to have a series of questions. Because there's going to be a searching of the heart that takes place in light of the information that we've learned in Romans chapter 8. To the point that when we get down to the end of the passage, there's something that ought to have to take place in our hearts. A persuasion. Do you, all, do you know what a, a persuasion is? A persuasion, in, in most cases, is a loved-based convincement. You are convinced of something. Maybe love's not the best word. In, in Romans chapter 8, it's, it's the best word. But uh, affection Based, a desired based convincement. What you like or what appeals to you or what entices you or what allures you or what you love can convince you. And when we get down there in Romans chapter 8, there's all these things that God has taught us, all of these things that the Spirit has led us into before we actually get into the con our instruction. He wants us to be persuaded before we get our instruction. And the way he does that is he does that by his love and by his gracious provisions that we are to be persuaded by. We're not naturally persuaded. We have to become persuaded. We have to have our mind uh, uh, shifted and altered by this information for us to therefore be persuaded, especially in the light of sufferings. Because naturally we don't want to suffer. So God comes along and provides you something to look at that's greater than the sufferings to persuade you that when they come, they can still work together good, for good. And so you have an issue of the heart is involved with a persuasion. And that's what he's going to get to by the end of that series of questions there in Romans chapter 8. But I go here to Romans chapter 6 is because Paul has brought up the heart before, not only in Romans chapter 1, but also in Romans chapter 6. And what he's referring to here in Romans chapter 6 is when you believe the gospel. And he's talking about when you believe the gospel in light of now your walk. Look what he says here in verse 15. He says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Just because we're not under law doesn't mean we should go sin. It says, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of, or of obedience unto righteousness. So the question then arises, well, have we obeyed? Have we yielded 
and have we obeyed? And Paul therefore jumps back to when we believe the gospel, verse 17, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed, and look what he says, from the what? Heart. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. The form of doctrine that he is talking about is the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And the content and the, 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 the nature of the information in Romans chapters 1, 2, and 3. And we've believed. And where do you believe from? The heart. You have obeyed from that heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And we obeyed by believing the gospel. That's what the gospel demanded. The gospel commanded that in order for you to be a beneficiary of it, in order for you to be saved from the dead penalty of your sins and be justified unto eternal life, is that you believe. You don't do anything, but you believe. And Paul's bringing that up in regards to now continuing to obey. The, the root of our obedience, the root of our walk on a day-by-day -day basis is faith, is believing what God's word says. Now God's word will come along and tell you things. For instance, uh, we've done this before, but look at Romans chapter 12. Verse 10, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There's the word of God that you have to believe. But when you get to the nature of these words that are in the form of instruction, that are telling you to do something, faith will then come along and say, I want to do that. God has taught me that I want to do that and so although it starts by learning and it starts by believing what he says it eventually is designed when it, depending on the nature and the form of the information it'll tell you to do something he said in verse uh, chapter 2 he talks about proving what is the good acceptable and perfect will of God the will of God is that you in honor prefer one another that's the will of God that's the mind of the Spirit that we're receiving at this point. That He's interceded for us that we now get to come to know. And what our heart should come along and do is say, that's our Father's words. That's His mind and His heart. I want to be a man and a woman after His own mind and after His own heart. I'm going to, in honor, prefer one another. Now I'm looking for opportunities to do that and to prove that. It doesn't say how you go about doing that. There's usually one primary way in which you honor someone. It's with your lips. But you're now going to look for opportunities to honor and, per, and in so doing prefer one another. You're going to be engaged in that. Not some legalistic way, not because you're under law. We're not under law. That's under grace. This, that's the knowledge that comes from God that we are to learn and that we are to prove if you so choose. But that's what he's looking for. He's looking for that in us. And he's looking for us to prove that in our lives. To, to manifest God in the flesh. That's God and to manifest that mind in our flesh. That's what we've been given the capacity to do. And so Paul says there in chapter 6 and verse 17, he says, you obeyed from the heart. So it shouldn't be a surprise that Paul once again brings up here in chapter 8 the heart and, and that, the, that the Father searches the hearts and he that searcheth hearts. In fact, the way in which Paul states it in verse 27 of Romans chapter 8 is that this, the Romans, the, the believers in Rome, already understood that. That God searches the hearts. And he knows what is the mind of the Spirit. 
That's what he's looking for. He's looking for a certain mind in our heart. That mind comes from, proceeds from the Spirit who received it from the Father when the intercession was made. And that's therefore then what the Father's looking for within us. Now, I want us to look at the heart a little bit more in Paul's epistles. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll take too much time here because we've been here before. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Just pick it up here in verse 9. Again, as he quotes Isaiah 64 and verse 4. He says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the what? Heart of man. What's supposed to have entered into the heart of man? Or what hasn't? What is he going to say? The things which God hath prepared for them that what? Love him. That's what has not entered into the heart of man. Look at verse 10. What's that word? Next first word. But. Before we're going on to read it, that tells you that God has provided a way for that to enter into the heart of man. Not just any man, the man that loves him. And we first love him. We're going to talk about this more as we go on. We first love him when we get to verse 28. You first love him when you obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. When you believe the gospel, that was you loving God. We don't think about it that way, but that's the way in which God thinks about it. He's, we, can only, we can only love God if he tells us how to love him. And, and he comes along and he commended his love toward us, and yet while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. But when we respond to that, we therefore are coming on the same page with him and that's his love towards us and when we believe it, when we obey from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to us, we love him. Now the same is true with every other form of doctrine that's delivered to us. Every other form of knowledge that the Spirit is, it goes to the Father and intercedes that we ought to know and he's going to now teach us by way of his word. That's why all this comes before the majority of Paul's epistles is to have you know how we are to deal with every other aspect of knowledge, wisdom, instruction, exhortation, correction, rebu rebuke, and reproof, is that we come to it, we ought to come to it with a heart that wants to obey, which is believing what it says, and then doing what it says to do, if it says to do something. Sometimes it doesn't say to do anything. These things of God, God now has provided to enter into the heart of man. It says in verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his, what? Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. He's revealed them unto us. And where are they supposed to enter into? Where are they supposed to go? Into our hearts. That's exactly where the Father searches. He searches our hearts. Look at some other passages. Look at, uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. And... Look at verse 11. He begins to shift gears here a little bit in chapter 5 and start talking about some people there in Corinth, some people that they're hearkening to. But look what he says here in verse 11. He says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion and glory on our behalf that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in what? Appearance and not in what? Heart. 
the examination of our heart is crucial. It's important. Here's men that were glorying in appearance. And that's, that's nothing. That's nothing. Where we are all to be glorying in is in heart because of what God's doing there. What God's doing there. Look at, um, look at Ephesians chapter 6. There's, there's many passages. We're not only looking at the, the ones that Paul, uh, we're not looking at every time Paul brings us up. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. And let's pick it up here in verse 5. Here's in the context of servants and masters. Essentially, uh, employee-employer relationship, obviously a little different back at this time. He, he's not necessarily talking about slaves, by the way. When he uses the word masters, he's not talking about, not talking about um, slave ownership and those kind of things. Although that could fit this context, he's not talking about that. Um, there were relationships, just like we have, where there, we, have a, we have a master. We don't think of it that way. That's not how our culture thinks about it, but that's how God uh, thinks about it. And we're servants. But he says in verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your what? Heart, Heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the where? The heart. Here he explains one of the ways in which you can do the will of God from the heart. If, if you are serving your master with eye service, you're not doing the will of God from the heart. You're doing it as a man, a man pleaser. That's, I'm going to work hard when my master's watching me. That's simply indicating that you're going to work hard so that you can please that your, your master. Please the one that's above you. Now we actually, if, if you were to teach that in schools, that's a lot better that you can teach that today than, than what's being usually what's taught and usually what's done. Is, is that not to give a care what your boss says and those kind of things. So in one sense, you'd rather have that in some other cases, but for us, is that we obey at all times even when we're not being watched. Because we're obeying in the singleness of our heart. And the singleness of our heart is as unto Christ. And Christ is not in one physical location, as it were. That once my, my boss is out of the picture, I can relax. Christ is, he's, he's in heaven. And not only that, even if he was in, even if Christ couldn't see us in one geographical location, he's Christ. And what he's done for us, our reasonable service is this, is to obey in all things. And so we're not supposed to look at our earthly masters according to the flesh. We're supposed to obey them, but in the singleness of our heart unto Christ. We're supposed to be looking at that completely different. And there's a heart issue involved in that. I hear many times at work, it's in me too. And with other, with other people, it's just always a complaining about work. I had a guy once... I was, a, I was a supervisor over him. And I'm the supervisor, and he's just complaining to me about everything. And I said to him one time, I said, well, why don't you go get another job? 
And he was sh shocked that I said that. Especially we didn't have enough staff at the time, enough employees at the time. And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, he said, all, you do, I, all you do is complain about it all the time. I said, if I complain that much, I would go get another job. Why put yourself through this? Well, it's paying for my school. Well, now you have something to be thankful for. Because this job is helping you pay for your school, so now you can come. And it's in a worldly sense, but he can, in the singleness of his heart, do good at his job, not complain about it, because it's helping him with his college education. But this takes that out of the way. I don't have to complain about my work anymore because I serve Christ in it. I don't serve my earthly master, even though he gets the benefit of my diligence at my work because I'm serving Christ. He gets the benefit. I'm not serving him. I'm not even going to get a paycheck, even though you need to take care of your own. I'm going to serve Christ. That can help you get out, roll out of your bed on the right side of your bed every single morning because you get to go serve Christ. But there's a heart issue in regards to that. If you're just looking at the appearance, if you're just looking at the way the world does, if you're just looking at it naturally and not from this perspective, then your heart is going to be there. Your heart is just going to be looking at the appearance. And what you say and what you do and how you do it is going to be a reflection of what's, what's, what's there in your heart, what thought in your heart you're operating upon. But if these thoughts are on your heart because you're valuing it and you're esteeming this greater than what is natural, then what's going to come out of that is a godly response. That's how we walk after the Spirit. Look at another one, a similar passage, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and look at verse 22. Again, same, same context. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Here he says, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, look at this, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men. Do it heartily, heart-like. Have your heart into it. You know, those, you know when you've done something and your heart hasn't really been in it, and you know when others don't really, when they do something, their heart really isn't into it. And we have something gr great now to influence our heart, our heart to be able to do something heartily. To have a care on the most minute tasks to great noticeable tasks. And the reason why even the most minute tasks, because look, he, look what he's going to go on to say as he goes on further. It says, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye shall serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Masters are going to, supposed to do what is just and right and equal because they have a greater master. And, and we're supposed to be doing things, even the most minute task, because he'll reward us for such. Because it's not necessarily the task we do, it's how we do the task. Now, in order to do the task that certain way, you have to still do the task. But it's how we do it. With what are, where is it coming from and what are we operating upon? The heart is involved. Look at, look at just a couple more here in Paul's epistles. Look at 1 Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy. Look at chapter 1 and verse 5. These expressions for a very long time in my own study were kind of just foreign to me. Just kind of read over them and said that was neat and kind of therefore then neglected them. But when you again understand the role that our heart plays in our walk, what it played when we first believed the gospel and, and what it plays. And, and, and by the way, we don't, know, we don't know inwardly how things work. We have to have the scripture to teach us how things work. 
and what is of importance and how God views it and how God looks at it. The Word of God teaches us about our inward man. We don't know about our inward man by nature, as it were. We know the things of man, and in one sense we know the, the, therefore the, the spirit of man, but we don't know the composition of our inward man. We get to know all that from God's Word. But look what he says here, look in verse 5, chapter 1. He says, now the end of the commandment is charity. Does he stop there? Oh, where is this charity to proceed from? Not just out of your heart, but out of a what? Pure. Pure heart. When you break down those words, he doesn't say, now the end of the commandment is charity. A lot of people out there doing charity but it's not out of a pure heart. The pureness of heart, the only, time, the only way you can get a pure heart is through the Word of God. When the Word of God renews your mind and when it cleanses your inward man and it gives you new affections, new thoughts that comprise therefore a new heart. And then he says, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. But he talks about a pure heart. In the pastoral epistles, he talks about the heart um, over and over again, and, and, and the good conscience, and those kind of things. So again, this is an important matter. Again, not only to Paul, but in the Lord's earthly ministry as well. Let's run a few verses here with the time we have remaining. Um, Look at, look at Matthew chapter 5. Look at Matthew chapter 5. And we'll kind of work our way backwards. Not in Matthew, but from the gospel accounts backwards. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Here's the Sermon on the Mount. Here's one of the things that the Lord, during his earthly ministry, as a minister of the circumcision, said. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 8. He said, blessed are the pure in heart. Why are they blessed? For they shall see God. For they shall see God. That's a, that's a great blessedness. It's not only physically, specifically in the future, but also spiritually, with the eyes of our understanding. When you're a man and woman after God's own heart, you're not, you're not necessarily looking at God's outward appearance. You're looking at his what? His heart. The things that comprise his inward man, as it were. Look at chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. Look at verse 21. Still the Sermon on the Mount. I'll pick it up in verse 19 to get a little more context. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. For where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your what? Heart be also. Our heart goes after what we value and what we esteem, what we treasure. If you treasure something, there, there will be your heart also, or vice versa. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Those things are linked together. The, the table of your likes and dislikes is the table of your heart. And so when you don't like something, that's reflective of your heart. It's something that I ask when, um, it, usually when I'm, when I'm reading or something like that, and I'm, I'm, here I am reading God's word, and it's like I'm reading just some other book or some it's like car manual that I don't care about. And I stop and I begin to have the scriptures flood my mind and recall it to mem remembrance in regards to what it really is and what it is my treasure. And there will be my heart as well. And then I begin to care a little bit more about God's word. 
then you begin to see things because you're actually looking at it. You're actually participating in it. You're minding it. You're engaged with it. But where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our heart, therefore, needs to be after the mind of the Spirit. That's what the Father is searching for in our hearts. And therefore, that's what our hearts need to be after. The mind of the Spirit. The things of God. Look at chapter 12. Look at chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Pick it up here in verse 34. There's another passage similar to this. Um, I don't know if we'll get to it, but he talks about how what, goes, what a man eats in his mouth doesn't corrupt a man. But what proceeds from a man's mouth, that which is doth corrupt him. Because what comes out of the mouth is reflective of what's in the heart. Verse 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? Isaiah the prophet comes along and says, and the Lord brought this up at, at, at another time, it says they do worship me with their lips, but their what is far from me? Their heart. How can you speak good things when they're evil? He says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. The things that the Pharisees, the generation of vipers, what they spake was tainted by an evil heart. Outwardly it gave a wonderful appearance, but inwardly there was evil. It says in verse 36, But I say unto you that every idle word that man, men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. A lot of times you see these things, the heart, what's being spoken, what's being thought, all in connection with judgment as well. well let's move on one more before we end. Look at Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Here we have a parable of various types of ground or soils or however you want to describe it and the seed falling on those various grounds and when he gets to the interpretation he describes the ground is the heart and the seed is the word of God uh, pick it up here in verse 3 he says and he spake many things unto them in parables saying behold the sower went forth to sow and when he sowed some seeds fell by the wayside and the fowls came and devoured them up some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. And other fell into good ground and, the, and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Now jump down as he gives the interpretation. Verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When any one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. Notice the heart's being brought up. That's the ground. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and Anon with joy receiveth it. <coughs> Yet... Hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while? For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word. Notice, notice that. When what comes? Tribulation. Because of the word, by and by he is offended. Does that individual bring forth fruit? He needs something. He needs to have root in himself so when that tribulation... If you're thinking about the analogy, we put some plants outside and the wind got them this week. The, the wind, and, and even before the rain came, the, the, the wind, the persecution, tribulation comes up and they'll, they'll, up, they'll be uprooted. And, and it can't therefore bear fruit. That's kind of the illustration being given here. 
but he has no root in himself. He's offended because of tribulation, persecution from the, because of the word. Now look at verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. And he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now there's a few things that you need, we need to understand here. One is to receive the seed, the word of God. We're not talking about the word of the kingdom. I'm bringing this now into Paul's epistles, the, the framework of it. We're not putting on top of it the word of the kingdom. We're putting on top of it the word, of, the word uh, that's coming from the apostle Paul. And what's getting established in Romans 8 is similar to this, is that before we even get um, the instruction that we need to get is that God with our, with our heart in Romans chapter 8 is, is, is providing for it to become good ground and for the seed of the word of God of, of simply what the word of God is and all that it's going to provide that it becomes rooted. That's why over in Colossians he talks about being rooted and grounded that you might be built up. In Colossians you're going to be built up in Ephesians. Right now it's about being rooted. And the rooting takes place of what we have in Christ and what we have in regards to the instruction that the Spirit's going to lead us in, that that becomes effectual in us. It becomes a rooted issue in us. That's why the persuasion is going to take place at the end of Romans chapter 8. There's a rooting, there's an establishing that takes place. That's the nature of Romans. Romans chapter 1. Be established. So we need to receive it and we're going to receive it when you hear it and when you understand it. I don't know if you remember when we went to Proverbs and we talked about the second thing, to know wisdom and instruction and to perceive the words of what? Understanding. And I described to us at that point, when we get to Romans chapter 8, we get our words of our understanding, our purpose. Why are we in Christ? Why are we saved? Why has he given us a new identity? Why hasn't he taken us out of the way? What is, this, what is the walk? What is it unto? What's the, what is its purpose? Before we even get into our walk, what's our purpose? What's the role? Understand it. And so many Christians and grace believers want to jump right away to, to getting busy and doing things, not knowing that what are we getting busy for? I'm not saying we're not supposed to get busy and get to work with some things, but what is it for? And you, you, you quiz them and you pose questions to search their hearts of why are you doing what you're doing and none of them will, almost none of them will come along and say, I'm doing this to gain, to prove the will of God so I can become equipped to function in the new creature in the heavenly places. And you ask something like, do you pose something like that? It's a foreign concept. And they're out there doing a whole bunch of stuff, but for What? They don't understand it. They don't understand why. They think they're doing good because they should, because I'm a Christian. You don't do good just because you're a Christian. You do be good because God has a vocation with you. He has a calling with you. He wants to do things now to prepare you for then. And each one of those works that we're supposed to participate in has specific purpose for the life that is to come. That's why I do things. Because my vocation, my calling in the heavenly places. The good ground is not only hearing it, hearing the word, but also understanding. This goes along with the gospel itself, but also into everything that we're going to learn. Because he's not talking about believing the gospel. The word of the kingdom here is the issue of bearing fruit. If we want that fruit unto holiness in Romans chapter 6 verse 22... We not only have to hear it and learn it and therefore receive it, but we need to understand it. If you don't understand something, it's not going to have the fruit that it's ought to. And the only one that produces fruit is the one who receives it on the good ground because he hears it and he understands it, and then the fruit comes. That's why we have Romans chapter 8. That's why we have chapters 9, 10, 11 before we get to chapter 12. The good works that we're supposed to participate in, we have to come to understand some things before that. 
We have to understand who we are in Christ. We have to understand how we are to walk, where that walk takes place, what it's unto, and what it is not unto. It is not Israel's program. It's not to bring the kingdom now. It's not to be a participate in the earthly kingdom and do things, the kingdom building and all these kind of things. Romans 9, 10, 11, if you understand that, then you're not doing that. Everyone who thinks that and is doing it unto that purpose, it's nothing. There's no fruit that they're going to have at the judgment seat of Christ. Zilch, zippo, none. It's going to be lost. They might be saved, they might have the foundation, but they're building a wrong structure, a kingdom structure upon the foundation in regards to the dispensation of God's grace. There's going to be a lot of loss. A lot. Because of not understanding the fundamental things of how we are to walk that the scripture talks a lot about from the beginning to the end. And here we find ourselves in connection with our walk here in Romans chapter 8, and we're getting the same kind of information. Maybe not spoken about and said the same exact way, but the same kind of information. The mind and the heart involvement in the walk and, and, and what that's supposed to do, we're supposed to understand it, we're supposed to receive it, we're supposed to hear it, we're supposed to learn it, the measure of how we're supposed to engage with it, and then our purpose of what it's all into. And when you have that, and then you add the instruction, now you can begin to bear fruit for the purpose in which you're called. For the purpose in which you're called. So we kind of went off a little bit, but when he brings up the issue of the heart here, He's talking about in general terms what the Father does and what he's looking for and the mind of the Spirit, that's what he's looking for. And our part in it all is to hear it and to understand it and, 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 and have the Word of God search our hearts and to care and love and value and esteem what he has for us to participate in his purpose uh, that, he, that he's planned for us. Well, let's, let's pick it up next lesson. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your Word to look at more of the heart. We've looked at quite a few things, Father. Although they might have blended some together, may we see the various components and what you do and as well as our responsibility. And Father, as we go forward, I pray that that just uh, be more and more clear and that we would take stock of our heart and the, the, the health of our heart. Not physically, not by a physical doctor, although that's important in regards to our physical life. But by getting in your word, because it's your word that reads us. It's your word that is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Your word, Father. Not just any words, your words. These words that we read, that we study, search our hearts. And so may we participate in that all the more. Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. If someone's here listening, if they have not trusted how that Christ died for their sins, was buried and rose again, may they do that this very moment. And the moment they do, they'll be saved from the debt and penalty of their sins, justified unto eternal life, having all their sins forgiven, past, present, and future, your righteousness imputed unto them, and they'll possess the gift of eternal life. May they not let another moment pass. We thank you for this time of grace giving. In Christ's name, amen.